All right, we'll get going here. Um, so everything should be updated on Canvas. Uh, the exam scores, so it'll look like there's two exams. Um, one of them, it says like the original, so that has all your, your answers and the actual exam that you took. The other one is just another uh, basically replica of however many points you got. It's just that that assignment is only gonna be graded out of 100. Notice on the original exam, there's 104 points. Um, and so in order to kind of have that displayed to you as what your grade was out of 100 in terms of percentage and factor that into your grade, I created that additional exam. So it looks like there's two but it's really just one being counted and the original one is just sitting there so that has kind of what your actual answers were and your, your total points, okay? Uh, other than that, I shouldn't, I don't think there's probably any questions before we jump into things here. No, okay. So we left off um, looking at some normal distribution stuff in Excel. Uh, I'll probably jump around a little bit today. Um, so we won't directly jump right back into Excel. I wanna talk about something first and then we'll kind of revisit that Indiana weather data file. So last class, what we did was basically we had some value for this continuous random variable X that we were interested in. And we wanted to know what's the probability we saw that or anything less or what's the prob probability we saw that or anything greater. We had to transform those cutoff values we were interested in into Z scores, then look them up in the table or use Excel, uh, use that norm.dist or that norm.s.dist, depending on if we wanted to find the, the Z score or have Excel do it for us behind the scenes. So we're gonna actually be using that same idea, but we're gonna be working backwards this time, okay? So instead of starting with being interested in a certain cutoff value, say 71, and then turning that into a Z score and finding the probability that we saw 71 or, or less, we're gonna say what is the cutoff score that the probability of seeing that score or anything less is say 0.2. So now we know the probability or you can think about in terms of a visual, we know the area to the left, we just don't know what that cutoff score is, right? So maybe another way of thinking about this is we've got this distribution for Z, actually I'll leave myself a little more room here. So I can kind of make the connection here. Let's do, here's our Z-score. Won't draw the distribution quite as high. Here's our original variable X. We know it's normally distributed. So now we're gonna say, okay, look, we know that there's some Z-score such that the area to the left of it is say, I don't know, 0.23, right? I can look that 0.23 up in the table, not as my Z-score, but as the area I want in the tail. So I'll look in that table in the middle, find the probability that's closest to 0.23, or hopefully I give you a value that's exactly in the table, that way it's a little bit easier. Once I find that probability, I can work backwards to find whatever that z-score is gonna be. Well, if I know the z-score, and I know the equation for the z-score is this, once I have my z-score, I know my mean and my standard deviation, it's basically just rearranging this equation to solve for what X value would give me that desired area in the tail. So we're kind of working backwards. Before we started here with an actual value for X and then found the probability. Now we're gonna start with the probability, work backwards and find out what that cutoff value for X that would give us that desired probability, okay? So this process is what we're gonna call kind of this inverse working inverse or inverse transformation, okay? So notice, <clears throat> excuse me, if I have this equation for the z-score, I can rearrange it such that if I don't know what x is, if I know the mean, I know the standard deviation, and I can find that z-score based off whatever the desired probability I want is, I can solve for what x, x should be, okay? So let's go through an example here. So let's say I've got scores on an exam. Let's say the average on that exam or the mean is 72. Those exam scores are normally distributed and they have a variance of 64, which if we wanna make it easier, the standard deviation would just be the square root of the variance or a standard deviation of eight, okay? What's the lowest score I could see that would put somebody in the top 10% or said differently, what's that cutoff score for the 90th percentile? Okay, when we think about it that way. So what score would put me in the top 10%, right? That's the lowest score that would put me in the top 10% of all test scores I could see from this 
normally distributed variable. <clears throat> Excuse me. So what we want is the area actually in our upper right tail is 0 0.1. Okay. So if we think about this, I'm starting out and I'm saying, and I always kind of draw the two distributions. So here's the standard normal distribution. I know that my original variable X is not standard normally distributed, but just has a normal distribution. So I want the cutoff score that would give me, right, that 0.1 in the upper right tail or the top 10%, the cutoff for the top 10%. Or we can think about this differently. It'd also be the cutoff score such that it would be higher than the bottom 90%. So I know the area to the left is 0.9, the area to the right is 0.1. Okay. Well, I know that there's some z-score that if I looked it up on that table, would give me approximately 0.9 to the left of it. Okay. So I'll work backwards. I'll go to that table. Okay, here's my standard normal table. <clears throat> Excuse me. I am now not looking up a z-score, I'm looking up this green area. What's this green area? These are the probabilities of being less than a certain Z value or those are the values in the middle. So if I have the probability, I'm actually looking up my probability in the middle of this table. So I go through here, what's as closest I can get to 0.9? So go here, these two are pretty close, right? Now, obviously because we're limited to, to go to the second decimal with this table, oops, get out of here. I know that I'm actually gonna be somewhere in between these two probabilities, right? These are the, as close as I can get. So the Z-score that would give me 0.8997 in the tail and the Z-score that would give me 0 0.9015 in the tail is 1.28 and 1.29. So the way that we're gonna do this is we're ever in between two values, always take the higher of the Z value. That's just kind of the convention that we'll use here. We could do some you know, interpolation or something if we really wanted to, but for the, for the sake of kind of simplicity, I know you'll, you know, shows me you have the, the right idea down. We're in between two, just take the higher. So 1.28, 1.29, the higher is 1.29. Okay. So we'll now use that Z score of 1.29 and just work backwards, right? We said that inverse transformation formula was, um, oh, it would be the mean, plus the z-score times the standard deviation. Well, if we go back to the slides, we were told the mean of this distribution for our test score was 72, so we'll plug that in. Our standard deviation, if we remember, was eight, and now we've got our z-score of 1.29. So it's just a matter of plugging those values in, determining what x should be. Now, one way to kind of make sure I'm not making a quick, easy mistake, like accidentally subtracting or something, if I'm looking for something that gives me only 0.1 in that upper right tail or 0.9 to the left, I automatically know that this score has to be greater than the mean, right? So hopefully when I compute this, I find something greater than 72. Otherwise, I probably made a mistake, right? Let's say instead of looking up 0.9, I looked up 0.1. That would have actually given me the negative will give me negative 1.29. Then if I plug in negative 1.29, I'm getting something below the mean. Well, that doesn't even make sense for the context of our example. We're looking for the 90th percent cutoff that, you know, what would be uh, the cutoff such that there's only 10% greater than it. Okay, so ho hopefully when we draw these out, that also helps us, right? <clears throat> Excuse me. So from there, it's just a matter of plugging our values in to our inverse transformation formula the mean standard deviation, the z-score we looked up, and we get the test score that would be kind of the 90th percent cutoff here would be an 82.34, right? So we're just working in, in reverse, basically. Any, any questions on that one? Let's go through another one here. So let's say instead, I wanted the cutoff score, same, same normally distributed variable, but now I want the cutoff score that would be kind of the cutoff for the top 60%. Well, that's kind of a weird one, right? But we think about it as if it's the cutoff for the top 60th, 60%, what's below it? 40%, right? So the area to the left now of our 
cutoff score is 0.4, the area to the right is 0.6. Okay. So we could go ahead and draw this out again, but let's just stop and think for a second. If I'm thinking about cutoff scores, which of these don't make a whole lot of sense? C and A. The average is a 72. The standard deviation is only eight. I mean, the, you know, the, the probability I see a test score below this, I mean, that test score would have to be almost zero. I, I'm doubting that's the cutoff for the 60th and 40th percent. Right? Now, these are probably something like the intermediate step. I'm guessing this is probably going to be the Z score that we end up using. All right? But let's, let's go through and kind of work this example out the same way. So we've got a very similar sort of setup. But now, all right, so here's our variable X. We know the mean is 72. Here's our standard normally distributed variable Z. Okay. And we want the cutoff such that there'd be 60% to the right or probably a 0.6 to the right and that would make the area to the left 0.4. Okay. Now right away, if I'm plotting this, how do I know where to plot that? Well, what would the mean be the cutoff score for? 50%, right? So if I want the cost, there's 60% above it, I know that my score is going to be somewhere over here, right? If I know the area to the right is going to be 0.6 and the area to the left is going to be 0.4, I know that test score would have to be something below the mean. Because if I'm looking at the area to the right of the mean, I know that's 0.5. Okay? Now I don't know what this score is, but I know it corresponds to a Z value that would give me 0.4 to the left or 0.6 to the right. So now the area I want to look up in my table is that probability or the probability I want to look up in the table is that area to the left of that z-score of 0.4. So I go back, look at my table. I know the area I want in the tail is 0.4 or the probability of seeing a certain z-score or less is 0.4. So I'm going to look up that 0.4 in the middle because it's a probability. It's not a z-score. Right, it's a probability. I want to find what z-score gives me that probability. So I look here, none of these are greater than 0.4. Well, that makes sense because if I think about this, what's the z-score for the mean? Zero. I know I'm looking for something that's below the mean. It has to be a negative z-score. Right? So go to our table, go down to the negative values. So hopefully now we can find something close to 0.4. Looks like it would be somewhere in between these two, right? That's as close as I can get to 0.4. So negative 0.2, scroll up here, 5, and in between negative 0.25 and negative 0.26. Right? So I'm going to take negative 0.26 there. When I say I use the higher of the two, in this case, right, it's like the higher of the absolute value. We get to the negative sign, we're taking the greater negative value. Technically, that's lower, but you know, we're thinking the absolute value here. So negative 0.26, that's our z-score. So here, negative 0.26 should be our z-score. Well, now we have our z-score, we have our mean. Remember, we were, had the standard deviation of eight earlier. It's a matter of plugging into that inverse formula, all right? So we go ahead. plug those values into our inverse formula, or another way of doing this, so I, I guess technically here. Uh, no, nope, I wanna go backwards, there we go. I could have plugged them into this formula, right? Another way I could have done this is how I have it displayed here, which is just, I'm gonna erase this real quick and give myself a little room. If I have the equation for the z-score, and I just plug things in here, so negative 0.26, don't know x, I know the mean is 72, I know the standard deviation is eight, now it's just a little bit of algebra, right? So I can do it either way. I can plug them into the formula for the z-score, do a little bit of algebra, or plug them right into that inverse formula, right? Either way, it's gonna give me the same answer. And in this case, that answer is about a 69.92, okay? Uh, now I put square root of 64 in here because we originally were only given the variance. So I could find that standard deviation and just have that eight plugged in, or I could kind of substitute, write that as the square root of 64. 
Either way is fine. We'll get the same answer. Okay. Any questions on this one? And it kind of makes sense, right? If we were looking for something that was below the mean, the score should be below that mean of 72, which sure enough, we found it was, right? Now, if I had forgot this negative sign and plugged in just 0.26, I would have ended up with something above the mean. And I, from my, you know, drawing that I have, my visual would tell me right away, oh, I must have done something wrong. Oh, I forgot the negative sign, okay? Any questions on this before we keep moving here? Shouldn't be too bad, I don't think. So before we move on to the exponential, oops, I didn't mean to do that. I meant to do this. Let's take a look at that um, Excel file from last class. Now, first of all, also, I had a mistake in here. Um, so I re-uploaded this. It's gonna be a more complicated thing. Uh, I'm not gonna make you guys reproduce this, but I had an error in there. If you were wanted to call me out on it and you could tell, I was just adding this, but for the negative values, I actually should have been subtracting, right? So it was negative 3.92, as opposed to when I added it, it was actually making it less. So I fixed that so that it actually should be a correct uh, Z table here. But we look at this inverse transformation sheet. I just put in those values I had in the example we just worked through. So I've got a mean of 72, a variance of 64, and I'll delete this here real quick. So I did the norm that inverse there. If I wanted that 90% cutoff, <clears throat> excuse me, I could have used that norm dot dist. Not dist, sorry. I can use norm dot inv. And instead of norm dot dist, it works the opposite way. I now tell it what probability do I want? Well, the area that we wanted was 0.9 to the left. You always tell it the area that you want to the left. Just like when we were looking it up in the table, we always are looking up the area to the left, okay? So I tell it that probability I want or that area to the left. I tell it the mean of this distribution. I then tell it the standard deviation. Well, if I have the variance, I can put in SQRT of the variance here, All right? So I can put functions inside of functions. So I don't have to do this in separate cells or like calculate the standard deviation somewhere else. I can literally just take the square root of the variance within that function. So this should return to me the same value that I, I found, right? So 82.25, if we go back, what did we find here? 82.34, so why is this a little off? Yeah, when I look at my Z-score, if I do this by hand, I have to round it to the second decimal. Also, I'm like, because I was in between two, right? But what Excel can do is because it's dealing with that actual function, it can return to you the exact value, right? And so you get something that's a little bit different than what if we did this by hand, but, but very, very close, right? Even doing this by hand, we get something that's very, very close to it, okay? What if I wanted to instead, um, oh, how could I do So I can go equals norm dot s dot i and v. Oh, sorry, I'm in the wrong cell. Here we go, equals norm dot s dot i and v. Now what norm dot s dot i and v does is it is gonna do the intermediate step and it's just gonna tell you the z value that would give you that desired area in the tail, okay? So it should be really close to point, what? Uh, what did we find for the first one? It wasn't negative 0.26, the first one was, uh, oh, I'm already forgetting here. We'll put 0.9 here for a second. I'll come back to this. Uh, 1.29, that was our Z score from the example that we looked at. So if I tell norm.s to inv 0.9, it gives me the z value that would give me 0.9 to the left. Once again, it doesn't have to kind of round to the second decimal, right? We were in between 1.28 and 1.29, so we took the higher of the two. This gives me the exact z score. The exact z score that would give me exactly 0.9 is what? 1.2815, okay? Now that I have that z score, remember I still want the cutoff test score, right? For my example. So now I can use norm dot uh, i and v, right? Nope, hold on. Now I'd have to actually plug this into my, sorry. So here I've got my z-score. I actually just have to use that inverse formula, which I just basically am using Excel to be a calculator, right? That was take the mean, add to it the z-score times my standard deviation, which I don't have here. So I can just take the square root of the variance, right? So this other way, I mean, it's, I don't know why you would want to do this other way unless you really wanted to know what the z-score was because it adds another step 
and you kind of have to use Excel as a calculator. This is a little bit, you know, I don't know, you have to type a lot more stuff in. Now it'll give us the exact same test score as just simply using norm.inv, which essentially grabs the z-score, throws it and the mean and the standard deviation all into that inverse formula for you, and then spits back out at you what that, that cutoff value for x has to be. All right? So it's kind of like when we went from norm.dist to norm.s.dist, or sorry, norm.s.dist to norm.dist. We cut out that middle step where we just we weren't seeing what the z-score was if we use norm.dist. That's essential what we're doing here. If we didn't use norm.inv, we're never seeing what that intermediate z-score is, but we're getting what we wanted, right? We're telling it what area we wanted in the tail, and it's going to spit out at us the cutoff for that. Now, if I started with instead the cutoff value right, and wanted to find the area in the tail, notice if I have this x value, we could use that norm.dist function. I know what my cutoff is, so I want to say what's the prob probability I see an 82.25 in my test or anything below it. So I can use that norm.dist, use that cutoff value I'm interested in, comma, tell it the mean, comma, tell it my standard deviation, so square root of the variance. And then we said this cumulative, we're using it just like the table, so we always tell it one, always looking for the area to the left there. And notice it would spit back out as the probability. So it doesn't matter which direction we want to work in, we have formulas in Excel that we can use to make this a little bit easier. Right? And like I said, if you do it by hand, that's fine. The numbers are going to be a little bit off because we're kind of constrained to that second decimal. Okay. We see any of those cells again? Are there any questions on, on any of that? Okay with that? Let me make sure. Let's see if the chat. Okay. All right. Um, I think that's all I want to say here before we kind of move on. Just to make, once again, no questions. We're okay with all this? Being really quiet today. Okay? All right. So now we're going to tackle something a little bit more difficult. All right? So we're going to do two other continuous random variables that aren't normal, like aren't a normal distribution. Um, the first is exponential, right? So this is the idea, if we were to map out an exponential distribution, it looks like this. It's not normal, right? It almost looks like the most right skewed you could make a normal distribution, okay? And that's because for an exponential, we don't see outcomes below zero here, right? But we see an infinite number of values to the right of it, okay? So we still have a continuous random variable because we can still see any value in between the integers. And, you know, just like the normal, not every exponential distribution be the same. Instead of being defined by the mean and the variance, though, the exponential is only defined by this thing called lambda. It's almost just like we were dealing with a Poisson, except for the Poisson was discrete, right? For if it's continuous, then we have an exponential. Okay? So here's what we can do. Um, we don't see lambda if we're just looking at the variable. But what we can do, let's say I have this you know, variable in Excel, I can find the average, right? Whatever the data so shows me, I can find the mean or the average of this variable X that I can see, okay? Now, I know that the lambda, if it is an exponentially distributed variable, the lambda will be one over the mean. Notice if I know the mean is one over lambda, if I just rearrange this equation, lambda is equal to one divided by the mean. Right? Once I have lambda, I know that this is the probability mass function or kind of the cumulative mass function that would give me um, the probability that for some value of X, I see that value or anything to the left. So it's essentially acting just like the standard normal tables. It's just the function is a little bit easier to deal with than the function was for the normal distribution. So whatever, once I find Lambda, whatever X value I'm interested in, I just plug in Lambda and X in this equation and it will always tell me the probability that I see that X value or anything to the left. So let's go through an example here and then I'll kind of show you an Excel. So let's say we know that a uh, car battery life, <clears throat> excuse me, is 2000 days. We know that battery life is exponentially distributed. And I recall that to find Lambda, if I can find the mean battery life, which here I'm told is 2000. So that's the mean of this random variable X, which is the length of the life of this battery. I can find Lambda by simply rearrange this equation and lambda would be equal to one divided by 2,000, or one divided by the mean, right? 
I could then use this probability mass function and say, well, what's the probability that the battery I have lasts more than, or sorry, lasts less than, say, a thousand days? Can't remember exactly what, what value I chose here, but we'll see in a sec, right? Okay, so we've got 2,000. I can rearrange to find lambda, so one over 2,000, or 0 0.0005 is my lambda. Okay. I then say, what's the probability it lasts more than 10 years? Well, what's 10 years? How many days is that? Just 10 times 365. I plug in 10 times 365 as my x. My lambda was 0 0.0005. I plug this into my equation. Now, this would give me the probability that it's less than 10 years. If I wanted the probability it's greater, what did I do here? Well, one minus that, the ones would just cancel. This becomes positive. And so I would just have to take this part of the probability mass function. Does that make any sense? I kind of skipped that intermediate step there. Here, actually, let me type this out real quick just to make it a little bit more clear. Uh, so we would have taken this guy. I want the probability x is less than 10 times 365 be equal to one minus that. Now, if I want the probability x is greater than, and we'll actually use the value we were interested in, 10 times 365, we would have just taken this probability, subtracted it from one, the ones would cancel, and we'd just be left with this second part. Okay? Does that make sense? Are there any questions on that since I kind of added that in there? And I'll update the, the, the slide so that I have this, this intermediate step in there as well. So really the only tricky thing there, I guess, is converting whatever mean you find into your lambda. Once you have lambda, I think this equation is relatively pretty easy to deal with, all right? And if I don't make things a little bit trickier by saying like 10 years and you have to convert that into days, right? If I just had the number of days, that'd be, make it a little bit easier as well, okay? So in that Indiana weather uh, data file, I have EXP and log normal here. Ignore this part for a second. Let's say, so what's in column D? Family income, right? Say I look at income, ooh, looks pretty exponentially distributed, right? Kind of has this nice exponential looking distribution. So what I'll do is first zoom in so you can see this a little bit better. I'll find the average of that income variable, right? That's all I did here is just find the average of that income variable. I can then find lambda by simply taking one over that average, right? Now that I have lambda, and I'll actually do another trick here, I'll add something in. Let's say we put in what we're interested in up here, the cutoff. So I think originally I started out with 20,000. Okay. I can take one minus, and in Excel, that natural number E, like when we take it to a power, we write in Excel as EXP. So EXP is really just saying what? EXP, what I have? EXP 05, so it's really just saying, right? That's what that EXP does. Whatever I put in parentheses in Excel, it's gonna take E, excuse me, E to that power, okay? So, Take e to the power of whatever lambda, negative lambda, times whatever x value I'm interested in. Well, I plug the number in here. What if I want to change it later on? Let me just use the cell reference, okay? So I can find the probability, right, that it's less than, what, 20,000? That income is less than 20,000. It's about 25% based off the data set we see here. But what's the probability if I choose someone at random, if it is exponentially distributed, that they make less than 40,000? We know that this probability should be greater, right? Because we're looking for the area to the left. We chose a larger X value. We get about 44%, right? And we could play around with this cutoff. Now it's gonna change. Now, down here, another way we could have found this, just like before, we could cut out one of the intermediate steps, which is um, having to kind of type out that function in Excel, like one minus EXP to the whatever. We could use this yeah, expon.dist, or exponential distribution, it tells Excel, use an exponential distribution, 
the first thing I'm going to tell it is what my X value, the cutoff I'm interested in is. So I had 20,000 there before, but I could change that to whatever value I want. I'm going to tell it my Lambda, which I did have to find that no matter which way I want to do this. So here's my Lambda. And then just like the normal distribution, we're always going to be looking for the area to the left here. Technically, I think I talked about this last class. If I put a zero in there, I really should be getting a zero return to me because the probably of any one value should be zero. But what Excel does, is it takes like a really, really small interval and returns that. So we're always going to use one here when it says cumulative when we're using these distribution functions. Okay. So this should basically use this formula, but I don't have to type that formula in. I just have to use that xbond.dist. Okay. Any questions on, on that? Okay. So if you have like an individual assignment and I tell you, assume that one of your variables, like whatever variable you choose from your data set, assume it's exponentially distributed. It might not be, but if it was, how could you find the probability that's below a certain cutoff value? You would treat it just the same. Let's say instead of income, I'm interested in, well, we don't have any great continuous, this isn't gonna be a great example, but let's do the highest grade level, right? So I instead change this to the average of highest grade level. So select so like that variable. I've got my average. Lambda is going to be one over that average. Now, why is this one? Well, if we think about, I've switched the variable and I'm thinking about the highest grade level and my cutoff is 40,000. Yeah, everybody's going to have a highest grade level below, below 40,000, right? So now let's change the cutoff to make a little more sense. What's the probability somebody, uh, uh, let's say has a high school degree or less, right? So we'll do 12 years, 12 years kind of representing the number of years of education. So 12 would be like 12th grade. About 59% of people have a high school degree or something less than that, right? which means that what? About 40% of people have something more than high school degree. So some college or higher. Okay. And you could play around with this. Well, what about a college degree? We'll say 16 years. Right. Kind of thinking about an average degree taking four years. It's not perfect. The variable is not perfect, but it gets at the idea. About 30% of people would have more than kind of a college degree. Right? Um, actually, sorry, would have a college degree or more, right? Because we're playing around with that cutoff and we don't have the equality included. So like I said, that, that's not a perfect example because that variable is not truly continuous. But I just wanted to show you no matter what your variable is, as long as it's continuous, you could treat it exactly the same way. You're just going to have to make sure you choose a cutoff value that makes sense for the context of that example, right? You can't be choosing 40,000 when you're talking about the highest grade level. You want to be thinking about something like 12 or 13 or something like that. Okay. Any questions on that? So basically in that individual assignment, you'll be doing something like this. Okay. With one of your variables. Right? All right. Now we get to the fun stuff. The log normal, right? So this looks a little bit scarier, but hopefully once we get down to it, it's not, not too bad. Okay. If I see some variable X and it's log normal distributed, as the variance gets higher, you kind of notice I have different log normals here. When the standard deviation varies, as it gets higher, it kind of pushes this to look close to an exponential. All right, oops, if I can get it, there it is. Close to, An exponential, but drops off a little bit steeper. So it's not quite the same. And then as we get lower and lower variances, these start to look closer to a normal distribution, right? They're still very right skewed, but they start right this green or yellow line starts to look closer to a normal distribution. We'll call this is log normal. So the reason why we call this log normal is because we see the variable y. Right? So what we see in the data is the log normally distributed variable. So we see y, okay? Y, if we could observe it, is distributed as e to the power of some random variable x where that random variable x is normally distributed, right? So if I were to kind of rearrange this a little bit, I would take logs of both sides. X would be equal to the log of y, the natural log of y. So if X is normally distributed, 
then we say y is log normal. So once we take the log of y, it is normally distributed. Does that kind of make sense where that, that terminology is coming from? X is the, is the variable that's normally distributed. All we can see in the data is y. But if I were to take the natural log of y, I know that it would have the same distribution as x, so we say that y is log normally distributed. So once I take the log, it would be normally distributed. Okay? Well, if I know that the natural log of y is normally distributed, and I have the mean and the variance here, well, now I can actually start to find probabilities just using a normal distribution. Okay? Now, the problem is, when I see that variable y in Excel, I can't find the mean and the variance of x. I don't see X. All I see is that variable Y. But I know that if I could convert Y to X, then that log of Y would be kind of have the same distribution. So the way that we can do that here is use these formulas, right? So I see the variable Y. So you could think about this as here is the mean of Y squared, the mean of Y squared, uh, sigma of Y squared. And if I put those into this formula, it would give me the mean of X, okay? And if I plug in, this is the variance of Y and the mean of Y here, that would give me the standard deviation of X, right? So these equations are giving me the mean and the standard deviation of X, which I have to use the mean and the variance of Y, right? Because Y is all I see in the data. And hopefully, when I, I think when I walk through an example in Excel, this will this help to make a little more sense too. But these are the equations we need, okay? And we see this pop up. So I mentioned that a lot of things like human performance are normally distributed. I actually found another example that crossed because they're putting on all this data. Here's one they put out that looks more like a log normal distribution, right? Has a really long right tail, okay? So let's work with some actual values and see how we would do this, okay? So let's say I have this variable Y that I could observe, which is the duration of a phone life, right? Or the expected duration of your phone. I don't know if this is in days or however it is, right? So, it's log norm distributed, and we see the mean of y is 500, and the variance in y is 5. So maybe we have this data set with a bunch of different people, how long their phone lasted, right? And we take the average of that, that variable, and we find 500 days maybe, and we take the, the variance and we find 5, right? So pretty tight variance here, but I did it to make the numbers a little bit different. here. So what I need to first do is find what the mean and the uh, variance or the standard deviation of X is. Well, how can I do that? I had that equation in the previous slide. I plug in that mean of Y. I plug in that variance for Y. And it'll spit back out at me what the mean of that underlying variable X is. I use the equation for the variance. I can find the variance as well. Right? Now I can find the standard deviation here as well if I took the square root, right? It's not only one more step, which would be to take the square root of the variance to get the standard deviation of X. Okay. But now once I have these, I know that I can write out that X variable as being normally distributed with the, sorry, with the mean that I found and the variance that I found, okay? Well, once I have this, right, what if I want to do, I think, let me make sure I don't have this on the next slide. Okay, I don't. So what I can do from here, it gets a little bit trickier. All right, so I'll stop this share real quick. I'll go back there in just a sec. So what I just told you was, I think it had three zeros in it. We now know that this normal variable X, we converted the variable we could see Y to find the mean and the variance of X. So I might then say, okay, so what's the probability um, that, that, length of my phone, which is what I actually observed in the data, is less than, say, 495. Okay. Well, I don't, I don't know how to use a probability density function for that log normal, but I know that the log, the natural log of y, was equal to x if y was log normally distributed. Okay. So now that I know that I have the mean and the variance for X, what I can do is I can instead, this is the same thing as saying, what's the probability that the natural log of Y, which is really just X, is less than, I'm running out of room here, hold on. 
Uh, I want to write this so you can see all of it. I'll rewrite this again. I just got to give myself a little more room. So the probability y is less than when I say 495 is the same thing as saying what's the probability that the natural log of y, which I know is just x here, is less than the natural log of 495. Okay. Well, now that I'm dealing with x, I've got the cutoff value I'm interested in. I have the mean and the variance of x. I know it's normally distributed. Now I'm just using the normal distribution, right? I can convert the natural log of 495 into a z-score, look that z-score up in the table, and it will turn to me the probability. Or I can do this in Excel by using that norm.dist function, because I now have my cutoff value, I have my mean, and I have my variance. Okay? It's a lot more work, right, when we have a log normal variable, right? But this really comes from the idea that I know that if it's log normally distributed, the natural log of y is equal to x. So that they have the same distribution, but they're equal to each other. So now if I can figure out what that mean and that variance of x are, well, now I can just start using cutoff values for y. I have to take the natural log because taking the natural log converts it into this x variable that's normally distributed. Okay? So if we go back to our example, we had that mean, we had that variance. Oh, let's skip a slide here. No, I think I just did it in Excel. So I'm never going to kind of expect you guys not to do this in Excel. So here we've got the log normal, right? I had some variable, um, and we just said once we converted it, so this was what, 500, 500, and the variance was 5. Well, in Excel here, I just used Excel to put in what that formula was for finding the mean for that underlying variable x, right? So, and this is the formula for finding the standard deviation of X. So all I did here in these two cells is put in these two equations, right? Just making Excel kind of do the math for me instead of plugging it into a calculator. Okay? Now, here I had referenced the mean and referenced the variance, okay? Because those were the two things I needed. So I'm just gonna copy these over, just to kind of prove to you. Now, I rounded my values a little bit here. So notice this is 6.214 instead of 6.21. And here I'm showing you the standard deviation. Before I was showing you the variance. So 0 0.0002, I'm actually taking the square root of that. So if I were to square the standard deviation, we should get, and this if I move the zeros is 0 0.00002, right? That just came from right here. So those equations are just like using the calculator. Now, if I want to find the probability y is less than, say, 20,000, right, what I actually need to do is use that norm.dist function. I'm interested in finding, is it less than 20,000? But remember, pop this up so I don't have to switch. Remember, when I have that cutoff value, when I go to the normal distribution, the only way I can do that is if I take the natural log of that value I'm interested in. So here I'll take the natural log, which is just ln in Excel. And on most calculators, it also is, appears as ln, right? Taking the natural log. I'll take the natural log of that value I'm interested in, 20,000. Once again, I could use a cell reference here if I wanted to kind of change it from 20,000 to other values. I'll tell it the mean of the variable of the x variable, right? Because I'm dealing with a normal distribution, but the only thing I know is normally distributed is that variable x. So that's why I had to find this mean and this standard deviation. Right? So remember, it wants you to tell, the, tell it the standard deviation, which is why I actually solved for it, the standard deviation instead of the variance there. And then just as of that other distribution, comma one, it's going to give the area to the left with the probability of seeing this cutoff value or anything below it. Okay. We're on time. Okay. If I do that, right, I should get, I get end up getting a probability of about, about oh, sorry, 20,000 doesn't make any sense. I was crossing my, we did 495, didn't we? So 495 was, right, the cutoff value that I have floating behind me here, right? So we'll use that, and we get about a 1.2% 
probability that we see 495 or anything below it, okay? Now, what we could have also have done, instead of putting in that, taking the natural log, if we just like don't wanna forget to do that, we can use the log norm dot dist function. So once again, you'll notice, whatever distribution we wanna use, there's a function in Excel, which is like some shorthand for that distribution dot dist, right? So now if we use log norm dot dist, we don't have to worry about taking the natural log of the cutoff. We just tell it that cutoff. So I'll just tell it 495. I still have to use the mean and the standard deviation of that variable X, but then comma one, what Excel will now do is take the natural log of 495 for me and then kind of put it into that norm.dis function, right? So we get the exact same value, okay? Is that, I know, I know this is tough. Is this kind of, any questions on this or? What was that function? Oh, oh, wrong cell. Just log norm.dist. And really the only difference there, right, is I just have to tell it the cutoff instead of taking the natural log of that cutoff, right? That's all it saves me, which is kind of nice because it's also easy to forget that you have to take the natural log of, of whatever cutoff you're doing, right? And, and the reason why is because the cutoff value you're using that's for just, that would just be for variable Y. But variable Y isn't normally distributed. However, if I take the natural log of Y, I know that would be normally distributed. And so whatever cutoff value I'm interested, interested in, I have to take the natural log of it in order for that to work, okay? Uh, I have an example in Excel here. I got a question in the chat real quick. How do you use this? Like, uh, receive AFR, how do you know? Oh, so in practice, um, so for the sake of this class, I'll tell you that the variable is log normally distributed, right? In practice, how would you know you should use it? Basically, by looking at um, the distribution for whatever variable, and if it looks kind of log normal, this probably, if we're doing income here, probably shouldn't be using a log normal, probably should use an exponential. But if you do have the distribution of any variable and it looks like it kind of has this log normalcy to it, then you would know you should, you should be using it, right? Now, you know, it's, hopefully you also know something more about the underlying data generating process of whatever variable you're looking at. Um, but for the sake of what we're gonna do, kind of eyeballing it from the distribution that you grab from the data is, is gonna be how we do that. But in any like individual project, I'll tell you it's log normally distributed, okay? So you'll never have to worry about like choosing the right distribution. It'll be made clear to you. You should be using the normal here, exponential here, or log normal. Um, so that was a good question. But once we know that we, we need to use it, we'll set it up just like this. Now, here was the example with the numbers I did in class. We could do the same thing with any variable. So if in an individual assignment, I tell you assume that choose one of your variables and assume it's log normal, right? Even if it's not, assume it is, you would then be able to, like let's say we do it for income. So instead of exponential, let's say we treated it as log normal. Well, we're finding the mean of y well, the y variable we observe is income. So all I do there is find the average of this income variable or the average of y. I then can find the variance of y by simply taking the var.s, right? Sample variance of this variable. Well, now that I have the mean and the variance of y, if I know it's log norm and distributed, now I have to convert those so that I can find the mean and the variance of that underlying variable that I can observe that's normally distributed, which is x. Once I use those equations to find the mean and the standard deviation of X, now I can kind of use that mean, that standard deviation for different cutoff values for my Y variable, or I can do the same thing, but use that log norm so I don't have to forget to take the natural log of those cutoff values, okay? So we'll probably revisit this next class and I'll show you what would happen if we had some other weird distributions, right? I'm not gonna probably for, like, give you examples of other distributions, but I'll show you how this idea of what we're doing with the log normal would apply to other things as well, okay? So we'll revisit this next class. Um, I'll get that individual assignment out there so you can start working on it. It has a lot of like norm.s.dist stuff in there. It has a little bit of this exponential log normal, um, which you can hold off on, because like I said, we'll, we'll revisit this and do a little bit more work with this next class, okay? All right, I will see you guys on Wednesday.